Um, my name is Phyllis Wellborn. I'm one of the senior benefits specialists here at headquarters, uh, our employee benefits unit. And I'd like to thank you for um, supporting our financial literacy month. And today's topic is our thrift savings plan, early to mid career early to mid-career. You should have a copy of your PowerPoint and then also your evaluation forms. This um, presentation is also being live streamed throughout DEA. So welcome to those who are viewing us via live stream. If you have any questions, uh, if you're uh, watching the webcast, just send a your questions to my email address and we will um, make sure that they get answered. Our uh, presenter for today is Mr. Stuart Kaplan and he is from the uh, Thrift Savings Board. Mr. Kaplan? All right, good morning everybody. Thank you Phyllis for inviting me out. So um, I'm gonna be up here at the podium where the microphones are because we are um, broadcasting this out. So if I leave this uh, podium, I, uh, they won't be able to hear me. So I hope you don't mind me standing behind this for, for most of the day today. But uh, so for those of you outside of the DC area, welcome. And I hope that you find this helpful and uh, interesting and uh, most of all I hope uh, that this is beneficial to you in helping you to build your your TSP account balance so this uh, of course is called early to mid career because the focus is on helping uh, you uh, or give you some information to help you make decisions about uh, managing your account while you're still working because it's sort of like uh, climbing up a mountain as you're trying to get higher and higher and build that balance up so that when you get to the point where you're actually going to retire, you're going to have a, 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 a nice size little nest egg that's going to support your lifestyle in retirement. So again, my name is Stuart Kaplan from, and I'm from the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board. Uh, we're located down on K Street here in DC and uh, we are a pretty small agency in terms of the number of you know, the number of employees uh, and contractors that we uh, have working for the board, but uh, we're a very large agency in terms of the number of people that we um, are responsible for, or we're trying to help, uh, and, and we manage their their TS, TSP accounts. So there we've got about 5.6, 5.7 million participants, which is about 2% of the U.S. population over the age of 18. So it's really a, pl a plan that is far larger than any other similar type plans, like uh, 401k type plans, those those types of plans. And uh, the amount of assets we have in the plan is uh, approaching 600 billion. We may be even over 600 billion now. I haven't looked recently, but the market's been doing pretty well. So as the market does well, our assets increase. So there isn't anything that's even in the, the neighborhood of the TSP. So one of the nice things about that is it brings the cost down. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to do before we get started here is just kind of uh, tell you what we're going to talk about. Before we do that, actually, I have to a little disclaimer. There's a slide there. I'm not going to go through everything in there. But basically, the main gist of this is that this isn't financial planning advice. So it's, it's uh, information about the TSP really geared toward helping you to understand uh, the rules and navigate them so that you make good decisions to help you grow your account balance. So, so that's, I think that's important. Uh, before I get started, I, I, I sort of have a, I, I want to talk just broadly about some of the benefits of the TSP, and we'll be touching on all these here today. Some of the benefits include the fact that uh, the plan is very simple. There's only five funds that you can choose from that are the core funds, and you can combine those uh, through the life cycle funds. Now, it might seem like that's, you know, not much choice doesn't give you much opportunity to be, to be diversified. But actually, we're going to go through this in more detail a little bit later on. In fact, this is going to be probably the, the subject we talk about the, the longest here this morning. And we're going to talk about how the funds work, what you're invested in, how they are diversified, and how they, uh, you know, they track indexes and how they're passively managed. And then we'll, we'll, we'll explore all of that. And I think you're going to see the wisdom and uh, the, the design of the TSP, which really works in your favor to help you accumulate a balance over your, your career in, a, in the most... Um, efficient manner possible. 
I mentioned we have low expenses. We'll talk about that in some detail. We'll talk about how the matching works with your uh, account when you make contributions and your agency puts money into your, your account. We'll talk about the G Fund. The G Fund is not something that probably seems to you to be something that's all that exciting or interesting. But uh, as federal employees, I, I want you to understand how the G Fund works so you can appreciate how much um, more of a benefit in terms of a stable value fund than you have than, than any of your uh, private sector peers. There's nothing that comes close to it. The, T the TSP's G fund is far superior. Um, you may not think that's a big deal, but uh, it, is, it is very important. For a lot of you, it's going to be more important as you get closer and closer to when you're going to retire and you want to uh, de-risk your account. But we're, we're going to spend some time talking about that. We're also going to talk about uh, how the funds work in terms of the components of the earnings on the funds, because it's not just the capital gains that uh, cause your account balance to grow. There's some more to that. One of the major parts of the TSP's design is, is the securities lending program. And I want to just give you just a little bit of information about that so you can see how that works and appreciate that uh, as a benefit with the TSP. So there's lots of benefits with the TSP. The light blue uh, circle there mentions you can keep your TSP account for life, which is really significant because of all these benefits are so great. Um, when you go into retirement, you can consolidate other retirement plan money into the TSP. Or if you leave uh, the DEA and uh, you don't retire, retire, but you go to work someplace else, you may want to um, take your future 401ks or 403bs, 457bs, or whatever, what, what have you, and when you leave those employers, transfer that money into the TSP so you can consolidate it all into one place. So we'll talk about that as well. We'll talk about traditional and Roth contributions, kind of go through a scenario and kind of have a discussion about uh, the benefits and pros and cons of each, each one. So now here's my agenda. And I, as I go through, so this, is, this is kind of the plan for what we're going to be talking about throughout uh, this morning up until about noon, I think is about what, what, what we'll finish. But uh, as we go through, I would encourage you to feel free to ask questions uh, and just interject at any time. I'm not uh, real formal about you know, having to wait for a certain section. And I mean, we got some folks uh, on the line that are um, we're broadcasting to. So uh, for those folks out there, if you have questions, you know, same thing. You know, please email your questions into Phyllis, and she'll let me know when she has the questions. And and we'll, we'll answer them. Uh, how, it may be, and we can see, take a look at the agenda, you can see what we're going to be covering. It may be that your question is going to be covered a little bit later on. And, and so for the purpose of helping to give context to the question, I may push that down uh, or uh, just a little bit until we get to that, that area. And then we'll, we'll talk about the, that topic in a little bit more detail. So we're going to focus first on kind of the context around saving for retirement. We're going to look at contribution rules. Make sure uh, you know everyone understands how uh, how to make contributions, to get the most bang for your buck. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the the plan, like I said, the design. They'll talk about the funds that we're investing in. Investing in. We'll look at historical returns, and then how to make transactions. We're going to talk about um, accessing money in your account while you're still working, because uh, some of you may have a need to do that. Uh, there's loans, there's hardship withdrawals, and we're also going to talk about uh, death benefits. So in the event of your death and you have money in your account, you want to make sure that that goes to uh, a person or a charity or a trust or something that you, know, that you want it to go to. So we'll go through all of that. So uh, this afternoon, beginning at 1 o'clock, we're going to be talking about the new withdrawal options. and. Uh, and, and all the issues around uh, you know, preparing for separation. And when I talk about separation it, with the TSP, it doesn't matter uh, as far as in our language, we, we're talking about retirement or separation. The rules of the TSP are the same. Uh, those rules associated with retirement, minimum retirement age, and, and you know, all those kinds of things for the, the FERS formula, that doesn't apply to the TSP. So the TSP is you know, separate. So if I say separation or retirement, um, just keep in mind that I, I, I use those words interchangeably. Now, with the TSP, we, you know, we're, we're, uh, we have a mission uh, statement at the TSP is help people retire with dignity. It really, in simple terms, it basically means that we want people to have the largest reasonable 
account balance that they can possibly achieve. And so that's kind of our goal here. But there's actually a, a lot more to that than that. But uh, let's just take a look at some of the basics uh, and put this into context. When you stop working and you go into the second phase of your life where you're going to do all those things that you've been wanting to do and um, looking forward to, but you've just been too busy working to be able to do all those things. You want to live where you want to live. You want to travel. You want to engage in the kind of hobbies and activities. You know, spend time with grandkids. Whatever it is that you want to do, you're going to have to have income to support that lifestyle. So, um, the first thing that we can put on our three-legged stool, which all you've seen before, is Social Security. So, Social Security is going to be there. We know it's going to be there. However, the, you know, the fact is. You know, we don't want to, you know, kid ourselves. We know that uh, the Social Security Trust Fund is being uh, uh, depleted, and it's going to get to the point in 2035. Uh, Social Security put out a statement here just a couple of weeks ago that said said uh, as much that in 2035, the trust fund is going to be depleted, um, and uh, at that time, there'll only be enough money to be able to pay 80% of promised benefits. So hopefully. Uh, there's going to be time for our uh, uh, representatives to act and to make changes to that. So we expect that uh, there'll be some changes and however they, those changes occur. In any event, despite all of that, we're going to have Social Security. Whenever we decide to start taking it, it's going to be income that we have every month for the rest of our lives. Now, I'm not going to go through talking about, you know, specifically about Social Security, but it's just important to know that that's a piece of our income in retirement, and it's protected by uh, protected from inflation because there's going to be coal increases attached to that every year. So this is really uh, something that's important for us as American citizens, not just federal employees, but it's going to be there. Secondly, as federal employees, we have a pension uh, if we work long enough. And uh, there's, there's pension formulas depending on our age and how many years we work and so forth, our high three salary. I mean, we're not going to go through all that. But again, this is going to be income that once we begin drawing it, it's going to last for the rest of our lives. And it's got prote uh, protection built f uh, from inflation, whether you're CSRS or FERS. And uh, it's something that's going to be another important leg of that three-legged stool. So given those two legs of the stool, I think, uh, you know, it's just like the three-legged stool. It's going to be a little bit wobbly, probably not going to be enough to support your lifestyle in retirement. So therefore, that's where the TSP comes in. So that's why it's so important we talk about it. Because for most of you, the TSP is going to be the strongest, you know, most important leg of that stool. And it's the one that you control. So the decisions you make about that are, are really critical. Now... I put this other fourth leg in there just to illustrate and talk about um, what happens uh, for a lot of folks who find that those three legs of the stool aren't enough to support their needs in retirement. Unfortunately, there's a, a lot of folks in that uh, boat. There's articles all the time. I, I um, had an article uh, I pulled up, it was published on April 22nd in Bloomberg. And, uh, but there's articles all the time. But th this article happened to be about uh, the rising numbers of baby boomers in the workforce that are, are in the workforce after they retire from, from you know, whatever their, their career was. And then they're going into you know, all kinds of fields. And there was data that they quoted from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But uh, the, the bottom line of that article was really about the state of retirement in America, that people are uh, going into retirement a lot less prepared for a whole variety of reasons. So as federal employees, I, I sometimes think that when these articles uh, talk about Americans in general, uh, that uh, I think about the benefits we have as federal employees, uh, including a pension, which a lot of our private sector counterparts don't have, either don't have a pension or it's not, it's not as uh, robust as ours. So hopefully we do a good job of this. We're not going to have to face the, you know, the... Uh, the prospect of being retired and having to go back to work, you know, after we've retired, because that's that's something I think that a lot of people want to do, unless it's a uh, um, a hobby that you you know you earn money from or something that you do that you know you're planning to do in retirement, because that's part of your retirement plan. Now, uh, to build your account balance, again, really simple, putting this in context. 
four things really that determine our account balance ultimately. Uh, number one is going to be how long we make contributions. When we start making contributions, you know, the sooner we make those contributions, the longer we make them, you know, the more money we are just dollar cost averaging over this long period of our career, which is a good thing. The second thing is going to be, of course, how much you contribute. Whether you contribute, you know, one percent of your salary, three percent, you know, if you are automatically enrolled. Um, sometime after August of 2010 and you just left it there, you'd be 3% of your salary. But uh, if you need to contribute 5%, we'll talk about that, you need, you know, that's what you need to contribute to get the full match. You can contribute, you can contribute more than that. You can contribute a dollar amount. But the, th the fact is, of course, the more money you put in the TSP, um, the bigger and faster it's going to grow. Now, you have control over those two things, but what you don't have control over is the returns on the money that you have invested in the TSP. You have some control, and it is something that uh, involves a lot of you know, good, rational you know, decision-making about how you set up your allocations. Because you can go all the way to the extreme, to the G fund, and be there your whole career, and you know that's probably not going to um, grow your account uh, by very much. You're not going to lose any money, but uh, I mean, technically you're not going to lose any money, but you're going to lose that opportunity to have your account grow a lot larger. But if you go too much to the other side, too much in equities, you're too exposed to risk, and then you go to retire, and all of a sudden there's a market correction, and then your account balance goes down a lot. So it involves um, a lot of careful thought. So we're going to spend some time today talking about the funds and how, how they work, and hopefully get a better uh, idea about that. And then lastly, the, the one thing that you don't really have any control over, and that is the expense ratio, the expense ratio uh, for, this is, we're talking about administrative costs of the TSP, because of course the TSP is funded by you entirely. It's not uh, uh, funded by American taxpayers at large. You know, they don't have any, um, uh, any interest in funding our, you know, defined contribution retirement savings plan. You know, we don't, we don't fund theirs and they don't fund ours. So. We, it's up to us. So, so this is the way all investments work, whether the retirement plans or not. Uh, but uh, you pay for the administration of the the plan in terms of you know our budget at the FRTIB, our salaries. You know, pay for the contractors and all the you know the, the systems and, and and that they use and so forth. So the good news it's a, it's a really small amount because we spread that cost out among a lot of folks. So we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more detail so you get a little bit better feel for that. Now, there's two slides, this slide and the next slide that I, I call in my bottom line up front slides because this is not rocket science. It's not complicated. It's not difficult. And I, uh, especially when I get into talking about uh, the funds, it may seem a little um, confusing or complicated. Maybe some of the rules are. But uh, for you as a participant, it's, it's not that difficult. There's two things really that I think are important to take away that you know will help you grow your account. The first one being just very simply, which you've heard many times before, contribute enough to get the full match. Uh, so you can contribute less, and sometimes you know your budget um, priorities you know force you to to contribute a little less than you might like to, but if you can, you know, keep a 5% floor to your contribution so that you get all the agency matching money. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes here. But uh, the other thing is, and I've kind of alluded to it already, is just be wise about how you allocate your contributions among the funds. And uh, that's, you know, something that it takes a little bit of thought. But even if you would like to have the TSP do it for you. You can use use the uh, life cycle funds, and we'll talk about those as well. It's a good option. Works for a lot of people. Uh, now, a couple of neg things you can do that have a negative impact on your account is kind of similar to what we we're just mentioning with allocating your funds, and that is trying to time the market, trying to guess at the direction that. Uh, the stock market is going, and then move your money around by doing interfund transfers among the, the core funds yourself to try to um, buy low and sell high and do that consistently. That's really a, sort of a guessing game that no one can, can do on a consistent basis. People get lucky sometimes, but uh, a strategy that involves 
you know, trying to follow, whether it's um, some kind of a website that uh, purports to have some kind of insight into where you should move your money and you pay a subscription and you, you get their emails and they tell you, okay, now move it over into C or S or I, whatever. Um, those kind of things, Facebook, you know, there's lots and lots and lots of uh, information out there that can kind of lead you down that path. But uh, in general, uh, a successful strategy involves a long-term strategy of readjusting and rebalancing. It's really kind of dull and, and, and boring. Uh, but the kind of investing we're doing with the TSP calls for a long-term strategy, not a speculative kind of short-term tactical strategy. So again, we'll, we'll spend some time talking about that. The other thing is, uh, while it's often um, necessary to dip into your retirement savings for financial needs that you have, or even to take out a loan, you look at all your options and you decide that's the best choice. The trade-off, of course, is that you're going to deplete your account balance by some amount for some period of time, and that's going to have a negative impact on you growing your account. But we'll talk about what your options are uh, toward the end of our uh, session this morning with regard to accessing money in your account while you're still working. So let's, let's get started. We'll talk about contributions. First of all, now contributions are through your agency's payroll system. So um, every agency uses, there's a whole variety of things. There's um, Employee Express, there's GRB, there's, um, what, do you, what, do you use, what do you use here? EBIS or MyPay or? EPP. EPP. Um, EPP. Employee Personal Page. Yeah, Employee Personal Page. Yeah, that's right. That's another one of those systems out there. So these systems are not connected to the, the FRTIB or to the TSP. So we don't have any um, access or control or any kind of you know way that we can you know get our our hands into those systems. So that's your agency's payroll system. So it's through that system that you make your contribution election. Now there's a paper form that we provide to agencies. This TSP one form. Uh, but for the most part, probably all of you go into those electronic systems, and that's where you make your election. So by election, we're talking about two things. One is you tell your agency when you get paid to take a contribution out of your pay, either on a pre-tax basis or an after-tax basis. So that's the difference between traditional and Roth. So we'll talk about that. And then the other thing, of course, probably the, the thing that's most uh, on your mind is that you're going to tell your agency how much to take out of your paycheck. No, these contributions have to come out of your paycheck. They can't be uh, contributions that you just make by writing a check and sending it to the TSP. So by law, they have to come out of your salary. But uh, you can choose a dollar amount or you can choose a whole percentage of your uh, pay, whatever that might be, 1%, 10%, 50%, whatever you, you want that to be. So once you make a, a, a contribution, that... Uh, amount that you contribute over the course of a calendar year, that is from 1 January to December 31st, um, has to be less, I I less than or equal to the limit that the IRS sets for employee contributions or participant contributions, same thing. So for 2019, the IRS set that limit at $19,000. So this means contributions that come out of your pay and it doesn't matter if those contributions have been taxed as traditional contributions or they've not been taxed and they're uh, Roth, I'm excuse me, if they've been taxed, they've been Roth, they're Roth contributions. If they've not been taxed, they're traditional contributions. So the, it doesn't matter. So we're gonna go through Roth and traditional contributions, but uh, the limit that you, from your pay, contributes, can contribute is $19,000. Any contributions to the company or agency are outside of that limit. Now, for the um, employees that are over age 50, you can contribute another uh, additional amount over and above the $19,000, but you're not going to contribute what's called catch-up contributions unless you intend to reach that $19,000 limit over the course of the calendar year. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But of course, if you're a FERS employee, you have matching contributions that your agency puts into your account each and every pay period. They also have automatic 1% contributions. 
So this is for everybody, regardless of the amount that you can contribute. That you contribute, if you contribute zero percent of your own pay, your agency still makes a contribution to your TSP account each and every pay period. That's equal to one percent of your gross pay for that pay period. For those automatic contributions, there is a vesting requirement. This vesting requirement is basically, it's a string attached to that money that uh, is, is attached until you reach the point where you have three years of federal service. And that three years of federal service can be all your current agency, it could be at a combination of agencies. You work a you know, year here, a year there, a year at uh, some other place. You add that all up, and once you get to the three-year mark, all of that money that's in your account that your agency contributed as a part of that 1% automatic and the earnings on that money belongs to you. If you were to separate prior to that three-year mark, and many employees do, uh, after 30 days, all that money is forfeited back to the TSP, uh, you know, just the HC automatic 1% and its attributable earnings. Go back to the TSP and they're used specifically to offset administrative costs. So that's part of the design in bringing the uh, expense ratio down. So the matching contributions have no vesting requirement. When they go into your account on a payday, when your contribution goes in, and the agency's matching contribution goes into your account, all of that money belongs to you. So let's take a look at how the formula works. Real simple, you don't have to read everything on the slide, but um, I think you, most of you know uh, that uh, your agency matches you dollar for dollar for the first 3% of your gross basic pay that you contribute to the TSP. So, uh, if you contribute 3% of your gross basic pay, your AC puts an amount equal to that. So what goes into the TSP account is equal to 6% of your pay, even though you're only responsible for putting in 3% of it. If you contribute another 2% of your gross pay, then your AC matches you 50 cents on the dollar for that last 2%. So therefore, if you contribute 5% of your gross pay, your AC puts in an amount equal to 4% of your gross pay. Plus, of course, we just mentioned earlier that they also put in AC automatic 1%. So therefore, you put in 5%, your AC puts in 5%. What happens if you put in 10% of your gross pay? Get a little bit better match, more money? No, you don't. You get uh, the same 5% match. But if you can put in more money, you can afford to do that, you're just going to grow your account a little bit faster. You might wonder, you know, I see on this slide, you see uh, a couple places, well, I should probably clarify this, BRS. BRS is Blended Retirement System. We, I don't see any uh, uh, Uniform Services members here. Maybe, I don't know if there's any Uniform Services members out there listening somewhere. But uh, they began uh, contributing to the TSP back in 2002. Uh, but the... Uh, uh, plan has changed a little bit for Uniform Services members, and in 2018, uh, uh, certain members could opt into the new blended retirement system, which reduces their pension, but gives them a match. So sound familiar? You know, for those of you that uh, remember way back to the days where we, we transitioned from CSRS to FERS, it's kind of a sim similar deal. So that when you see BRS, that's the blended retirement system for the Uniform Services that has matching. All right, so this little table here references, as this is actually a table that was taken out of our summary booklet. So if you have a chance to take a look at our publications on the website, uh, you can find them if you look in the, uh, kind of the upper right portion of the home page of the website where it says forms and publications. If you click on that, you'll see where we have a menu on the left-hand side where it lists all of the various topics. You can click on the topic and look to the right and you'll see two sections, forms and then publications. And under publications we've got this summary booklet which is most of the things I'm talking about here today. Um, but I, uh, there's a couple of other resources that I'm using from our website. And on all of the slides I have the 
Uh, well, not all of them, almost all of them. I have a link at the bottom right for the resource that you can go to. Um, and most of those resources are on our tsp.gov website or they point to our printed publications that uh, you can download as a PDF and you don't have to print them out. You can just look them on the screen. But uh, if you get a, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Phyllis, probably, they probably can get an electronic copy of that PDF, can't they? Yes. So then that make it easier to just click on those to find those resources. All right, so the next slide has um, some helpful information about maxing out your contributions. So in other words, you may want to get as much money in your TSP as possible so you're on a glide path to get you to $19,000 worth of employee contributions by the end of the calendar year. So there's a pitfall that can occur if you front load your account, you get too much money into your account too early because the limit is $19,000. And because the match is on a per paycheck basis, if you max out early in the year, then you're going to have some pay periods that you're not going to be able to make a contribution. And then that's going to be the, the issue that this slide's going to show you is that you're not going to be able to get the full match over the course of the year. So let's just go through all those. Um, animations and you can see we're comparing Ed is the kind of the blue table and uh, Susan is the orange one. Ed begins the year with his very first paycheck contributing 30% of his $3,000 gross pay. So 30% of 3,000 is 900. He continues to do that and so after 21 paychecks he's contributed $18,900. So for the next paycheck, even though he has not made a change to his contribution election, his payroll office is only going to take $100 because his payroll system doesn't allow him to contribute more than $19,000. So therefore, he gets matched on only 3% as opposed to you know, 5% before because he, his contribution was way over 5%. So then from paycheck number 23 through 26, he's already maxed out, so he can't make any more contributions. So he's missing out on that 4% match for four paychecks. 4% 4 um, of $3,000 is $120. So that's where that $120 comes from. So let's look over on the other side. And Susan, she has uh, elected to make a dollar amount contributions. At the beginning of the year, maybe back in December actually, she went and she looked at her, um, her budget and she said, I think I can afford to max out my contributions for this coming year. She looked at the uh, contribution limit and uh, the IRS said it's $19,000 and on the TSP website in the end of October, we publish that every year. And so she knew it was $19,000 Then she looked at a GSA pay calendar. She counted up the number of pay checks in the coming calendar year, and she counted up 26. Now, it could have been that uh, that pay year might have contained 27 pay periods, maybe 25. You know, that happens sometimes. But uh, this particular year was 26. So it just simply took 26 into $19,000, and that little division problem gave her uh, 500, excuse me, $730 and some change. And because in her payroll system she can only contribute a whole dollar amount, she rounded it up to $731. And that was her contribution each and every pay period. It got her the full match, got her to the end of the year. She was firewalled there uh, about $6 short of that $731 uh, when she got to $19,000. But uh, the, the uh, outcome was that she was able to make uh, a contribution each and every pay period that was at least 5%, and therefore she got the full match. So we compare her and Ed, and so uh, Susan came out ahead by about $510. So pretty simple. Um, not everybody's going to max, max out. You know, maybe uh, 6 to 7% of participants in the TSP uh, are maxing out. So if you're not maxing out uh, right now, uh, 
you uh, you got a lot of company, but this is it's important if you do. Now for employees that are a little bit older, if that is if you're over 50, or even if you're turning 50 in the current calendar year, you're going to be able to make a separate election through your agency's payroll system and contribute an additional amount. And this is a whole dollar amount, and you'll do these contributions simultaneously with your regular contributions because, as we just saw, we don't want to you know, max out the regular contributions, then start the catch-up contributions. And then for those of you who have not seen how these, these contributions work, um, they're, they're separate elections. You would not just increase the amount of your regular contributions because those are capped at $19,000. This is another link that says, you know, specifically for catch-up contributions. And when you go in there, it's going to ask you if, you know, you want to make catch-up contributions, are you planning to contribute up to the $19,000 limit by the end of December? And if you mark yes, you can continue on to the next step. If you mark no, it's going to kick you out because uh, there's no point in doing catch-up contributions if you're not planning to max out, that is, reach the elected deferral limit of $19,000 with your regular contributions. Because mainly, these contributions are not matched. So this is kind of built into the system protect people to protect people from um, making contributions under catch-up that aren't matched in lieu of making regular contributions. So that can happen. So that's why that's built into the system. When you get to the point where you can make your election, it's going to ask you how much do you want to contribute each pay period. And uh, you want to read that carefully and uh, understand it doesn't say how much you want to contribute over the course of the entire calendar year. A lot of people make that mistake and they end up with, you know, uh, the next paycheck that they get is, you know, zero because they accidentally put in like, you know, 3000 or $6,000 or something on that. So you'll put down uh, whatever you want to contribute for, you know, each pay period. And with catch-up contributions, you can always uh, make changes to it where maybe you stop your contributions and you restart them. Maybe you want to do your catch-up contributions at the beginning of the year, mostly, to get into the account sooner. Maybe you want to wait till the end of the year, see what your budget looks like, see if you can afford to make those catch-up contributions. It's perfectly fine because there's no match at attached to those catch-up contributions. When you get to the end of the calendar year, your regular contributions will continue into the next calendar year without you doing anything. The catch-up contributions don't work that way. The catch-up contributions will stop with your very last paycheck of that calendar year. So therefore, it's up to you to go back into your um, EPP and restart those contributions. You can set it up so that you do it in December, so that your new contribution amount is effective for the new calendar year, or just whenever you want. But just know that they're going to stop at the end of the calendar year. Are there any questions so far as we've, we've covered uh, um, about 17 slides? All right, please feel free to, to jump in there. This is probably, this is just a lot of rules. So we're going to kind of move past the rules here in a little bit. Um, but uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is, yes, ma'am, yes. Are you able to pay the amount in full, or do you have to do like, um, I guess, um, pay on a by bi weekly by weekly basis? How, how does that work? Well, with the catch up contributions, it's up to you. If you if you wanted to front load those contributions to the extent that you know it's got to come out of your paycheck, so you, you know whatever you put into the catch up contributions is going to be. You know, not in your your net pay. So 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 you're saying it has to come out of your paycheck. You it has to come out of your paycheck. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You bet. 
All right, so let's let's talk about uh, ketchup, uh, not ketchup, but uh, traditional versus Roth contributions. I think everybody knows. Let's just let's just review, and then we'll move on to what the qualification rules are for Roth earnings. But when you make a traditional contribution, you're taking that contribution off the top of your gross pay, putting it into your TSP account, and then what's left in your pay is subject to federal income taxes. So that contribution goes into the TSP account and it's not going to be um, taxed as the years go by. It's going to grow tax deferred along with all the earnings. And when you take that money out as a withdrawal in the future, or whatever point that is, and it's money that you know comes to you that you can touch and spend, that's when it's going to be taxable in that calendar year. So in terms of taxes, you're getting a tax break today because you're lowering your tax base. And then you're going to pay tax in the current calendar year based on your marginal tax rate. But you're going to kick a portion of that into the future with pre-tax contributions, tax deferred contributions. So that when you take that money out in the future and receive it, you're going to pay at your marginal rate at that time. So this is this is kind of an important part. So we'll, we'll get to that uh, difference uh, in a little bit more detail. But your agency's contributions that are automatic and matching will always be pre-tax. So in any and all cases, regardless of the tax character of your contributions, the contributions that your agency puts into your account are always pre-tax. Your HC is never going to pay the tax for you. And this doesn't matter if you're in the TSP or you separate from federal service and you're working for a company that has another defined contr contribution plan. It's the same wherever you go. Your HC is not going to put um, contributions into your account and for which they pay the tax on for you. That's not going to happen. Now with Roth contributions, you're going to get paid. Federal income tax withholding is going to apply. And then your contribution is going to go into your TSP account. And that contribution is not going to be taxed again because you've already paid the tax on it. So you're not going to be double taxed on it. But what has not been taxed is the earnings. So as the years roll by and you accrue earnings on those contributions, they're going to be considered tax deferred, just like your traditional contributions and their earnings. But the difference with the Roth contributions is the earnings on those Roth contributions have the potential to become tax free. And when they become tax free, you take a withdrawal, you don't owe any taxes. But again, the matching and the automatic 1% will always, always, always be pre-tax. So let's take a look at the qualification rules because this is important. If you're planning to make Roth contributions, the assumption is that you're intending to meet both of these qualification rules so that your earnings are tax-free. Otherwise, making Roth contributions is not going to make any sense. So there's two rules you have to meet. The first one is the five-year rule. And this means that if you take a withdrawal of the Roth money that's in your account, and that withdrawal occurs more than five years after January 1st, of the year that you made your very first Roth contribution, you've met the five-year rule. So this isn't a rolling five years that you know every contribution you make, we start five-year count from that. It just means that if I made my very first Roth contribution today, um, what, what is the what is the date today? It's the thirtieth today, right? Isn't it? So May, so April, May, April thirtieth, two thousand nineteen is my very first. Roth contribution. When will I meet the five-year rule? 
five years from January 1st of 2019, so that'd be January 1st of 2024, right? Oh, January or the, the, the year of the contribution? So, yeah, that's January 1st, of the year that I made my first Roth contribution. Oh. So it'd be uh, January 1st, 2024, I would meet the five-year rule. So that's just a one-time rule. Once I meet it, I'm done. The other thing that I have to do um, in order to qualify those earnings as tax-free is I have to be over the age of 59 and a half. So if I'm over 59 and a half and I'm at the five-year rule, I take a withdrawal of that Roth money and I don't pay any tax. Contributions have already been taxed, but the earnings are tax-free. So that's what I'm trying to do when I, I, I uh, invest in the TSB. Uh, with Roth contributions. Now, I want to just take this a little bit further because it can be a little bit confusing, but before I do, you'll see that there are a couple of exceptions to this age 59 and a half. One is disabled. Disabled meaning that the IRS certifies that I have a disability for which I'm unable to engage in gainful employment. So this is uh, not the same thing as having a VA disability rating. That's completely um, uh, something different. So this is essentially, if I qualify for Social Security disability income, well then uh, I would use that as proof to provide to the IRS and then they would grant me this exception. The other one, of course, is if I die, I got money in my TSP account, some of it's Roth money, and my beneficiaries are uh, uh, you know, going to receive that money, then uh, they'll get that, though, that money with the earnings being tax-free as long as that five-year rule is met. And that five-year rule continues to, to, to you know, go forward, you know, from that, you know, the January 1st of the date I made my first contribution. So it doesn't matter if I've, you know, deceased or I separated, there's no, you know, end date to that, you know, okay, now the five-year rule stops and you, you didn't quite make it and it, there's nothing you can do about it. It continues to go. So even if it's a beneficiary receiving that Roth money, five-year rule still counts, but that's it. So there's uh, some confusion here sometimes because with the Roth qualification rules, we see the age 59 and a half up there. But you've seen age 59 and a half listed somewhere else before, haven't you? You've seen it listed uh, whenever we talk about early withdrawal penalties. So in general, all retirement plans, you know, IRAs, 401ks, TSP, the same. It's IRS rule that in general, uh, that's the point at which uh, the penalty goes away. Now, there's a variety of, of exceptions for FERS employees. Uh, there's actually two separate rules for FERS employees that are not public safety employees. Then if you separate or retire and you're over the age of 55 or you, the calendar year you turn 55, there's no penalty for you. For public safety employees, air traffic controllers, firefighters, law enforcement, a lot of folks um, here, I'm sure, um, you would uh, qualify for that exception. Uh, so if you separate or retire in the calendar year you turn 50, or you're older than that, well then the withdrawals you take out after that are uh, uh, penalty free. So the difference here is, let's say for example, you, re you separate at age 49, but you don't turn 50 until next year. Uh, but you want to start taking withdrawals from your TSP account, you would have a penalty of that 10% um, for each withdrawal that you make up until the year you reach age 59 and a half. So therefore, you know, you're probably already aware of this, you probably you know, want to at least get to January 1st of that year that you turn 50, or if you're not a public safety employee, age 55, and therefore you can avoid that penalty altogether. Now this is for the early withdrawal penalty, but it kind of butts up against the Roth rules because, you know, let's say that you have Roth money in your account and you separate and you're age 51, you're a law enforcement officer. No penalty on tax deferred um, distributions, but would you meet the criteria for Roth? Is that the same exception that applies to Roth? No. On the Roth money, those earnings would not be tax-free until age 59 and a half. So, so we don't want to confuse the early, you know, the exception to the early withdrawal penalty with the Roth qualification rule. 
Now, we're, we'll talk about this later this afternoon, but if this is the case for you, if you've got Roth money and traditional money in your, well, of course, if you've got Roth money, you've got to have traditional money in your account um, based on the fact that your agency is putting in traditional money. But uh, with the new withdrawal rules that are going to be going into effect in September, you'll be able to choose from which bucket, that is, which tax character uh, that you take your withdrawals from. So you might choose to hold off on the Roth withdrawals until you meet age, you know, until you're age 59 and a half, and therefore you can take those withdrawals with earnings being tax-free. But yet you still avoid the early withdrawal penalty because you separated over 50 or age 50, or you know, the, those that are not law enforcement officers would be 55. So I know that that it's confusing. Uh, there's a link on this slide if you wanted to look at that a little bit more detail. Uh, but do you have any questions that I can clarify before we move on? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, here, okay. Okay. My question is, is this Roth TSP something that's new? Because I've been in TSP for years, and I've never seen the Roth side of that introduced. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I would say it's new now. It was, uh, we uh, had it in May of 2012 is when we first began accepting Roth contributions. Yeah. Is there a question back in the corner, back there? Yes. Hi, I just wanted to be clear. Um, so if you separate um, from the, your federal service at, the, at your MRA, your minimum retirement age, which is like 56 and a half, mm -hmm. and you take a, 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 a withdrawal or a, maybe a portion, will that not be taxed? Well, at uh, age 56, you would uh, be over the age of 55 when you separate. So you would not be subject to the early withdrawal penalty, but uh, if it's tax deferred contributions, as I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, you will pay tax when you take the money out. So that paying tax and then the, the early withdrawal penalty are not the same thing. Don't, oh, okay, don't confuse okay. those that's two what I'm, things. Okay, so I got confused. So you won't be penalized for no. taking, okay, yeah. thank you. You bet, okay. Oh, uh, yes ma'am, right here. A Roth. Oh, thank you. Can you invest in a Roth and your TSP and be allowed to go over the nineteen thousand? So when you say can you invest in a Roth, I'm assuming you're talking about a, a Roth IRA, individual yes. retirement account, outside of the TSP. Yes. Yes, absolutely, because the uh, limit that the IRS allows you to contribute to a Roth IRA outside of an employer is six thousand dollars, and so you can contribute all the, all the way up to that full six thousand dollars. And separately from that, through your employer, TSP, you can contribute up to $19,000. And then you can deposit that, let's say when you get to 55 or over, you can now bring that into the TSP? Well, Roth IRAs uh, are something that the IRS doesn't allow to be transferred into another retirement plan. Okay. So you would not be able to transfer a Roth IRA into the TSP. We're going to talk about transferring outside money into the TSP, but uh, a Roth IRA is an account type of account that cannot be transferred into the TSP. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right, so uh, we move on. All right, so let's take a. a oh yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. So can you say? Are you saying we can have a Roth TSP and a TSP and an individual retirement account? Because you said six thousand is the maximum for an individual retirement account per year, correct? Correct. So and let me just... And then you also said for the TSP, there's what, 18, 19,000, 19, and then you can do the catch-up for an additional 6,000, correct? Correct. And then you can you also have a Roth TSP in addition to a regular TSP? I guess that's really my question. So, uh, so let me just kind of clarify because I think uh, I see there's um, some misunderstanding probably based on the terms, but you have one TSP account. We can't have two TSP accounts. But in that one TSP account, you can make Roth contributions and traditional contributions. 
So sometimes we're used to Roth IRAs. We have a Roth IRA over here, then we have a traditional IRA over there. Then we think the same thing's true with TSP, but we don't. We have one TSP account. And the total of your contributions can exceed $19,000. 10,000 can be Roth, 9,000 can be traditional, however I want to divide that up. But it's one TSP account that allows those, you know, two different tax characters. And in addition to that, the catch-up contributions um, is, it's not, again, it's not a separate account, it's just putting more money into your one TSP account. And those contributions can be Roth, or they can be traditional, they can be a combination of the two uh, for the folks who are over 50, yeah. But the Roth IRA, that is, now that is a separate account, and that's completely outside of you know, your, the TSP, outside of employer plans. You set that up yourself. You choose where you want to have you know, your account, what you want to invest in. Um, but uh, having a TSP account doesn't have any effect on you choosing to have an IRA. But the maximum for the Roth is 6000 Yeah. Roth IRA. I just want to make sure in case somebody thinks that no, plays the, the TSP. No, the IRA itself is also 6000 did you say that per year? Uh, so a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA, any IRA, the limit for 2019 that you can contribute to that is $6,000. If you're over 50, you can contribute another, another $1,000. So don't confuse that with a TSP. The TSP's limit is $19,000, regardless of the tax character of your contributions. Is everyone completely and totally confused now? No, okay, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna assume that, okay. All right, so the issue of whether it's better to do Roth contributions or traditional contributions uh, often comes up. And there is no clear-cut definitive uh, answer to this because it hinges around what's gonna happen in the future. So unless you have a crystal ball and you can go into the future and tell us what tax rates are going to do at the time that you know you retire or that we retire, um, we're, it's it's really something that we're going to have to guess at. So here's a scenario which is the same basic scenario that you'll find in the summary booklet, and you'll see on the slide I've got a reference for that that you can, once you get the electronic version you click on it. It takes you to the summary booklet on page eight, and you'll see a similar chart. They use a little bit different numbers, but it's the same idea. And, the, and what I want to do is I want to show you a scenario where there's an equal impact on the person's net pay over the course of the year. So it's December, and he is looking at his budget and trying to figure out how much he can afford to put toward his retirement savings for the next calendar year. Got a lot of things to look at, but how much he can contribute is going to depend on his other expenses and his other income. So he does all the math and he figures out, okay, I can afford to spend $10,000 to save in my TSP account. So I say spend because you know, you'll see that, you know, we either save or, you know, part of it's going to be taxable. So we'll just say how, that's how much you can afford to put toward his retirement. So he realizes that if he puts $10,000 into his TSP account on a pre-tax basis, he'll have to pay tax in the future on that money when he pulls it out. But he knows he can put $10,000 in because it comes right off the top of his pay. It's not taxed. On the other hand, his other choice would be to pay tax on the contributions before it goes into his TSP account. And this is, his, this is what he's doing as a Roth contribution. So in order to figure out how much he can actually contribute, he's got to figure out how much tax is going to be applied to that $10,000. So he's in the 22% tax bracket, and he knows that this is the tax he's going to pay on his last dollar of income. Therefore, he can take 10,000 times 22%, gives him $2,200. That's equal to the amount that he's going to have to pay in taxes based on his 22% rate. So $2,200 from $10,000 equals $7,800. Therefore, $7,800 is his Roth contribution. 
So if he makes that $1,700 contribution to the Roth bucket of his account, or he makes a $10,000 traditional contribution, the effect on his net pay is exactly the same. So he's got to think about which one is better, and which one is better is going to depend on his tax rate in the future. So he's got to do some calculations here. And what he's going to do, he's, he's going to do a future value calculation. He can do it on his Excel spreadsheet pretty easy. He's got to have a couple more variables to put into his formula. And one variable is going to be, what's his average annual rate of return? And he's going to plug in 7%. Now, in the future, the market is going to go up and down. It's going to fluctuate all over the place. But he's, for the purposes of this calculation, it really doesn't matter. He's just got to plug in a number. Uh, and so he plugs in 7%. Now, what's the period of time that he's going to look at for his future value? He's going to plug in 25 years, because that's what he's thinking. He's going to retire in 25 years. So on the Roth side, the calculation is real easy because he just takes the $1,700, plugs it into his formula, 7% over 25 years, and it gives him a future value of $44,658. Whatever his tax rate is in the future doesn't matter because he's already paid tax. So now he goes back to the traditional column, and he does the same future value calculation but now, what he's got to do is he's got to subtract from that future value the amount he pays in taxes at that time. So the higher his tax rate in the future, the more tax he's going to pay. The lower his tax rate, the less tax he's going to pay. So therefore, you can see the difference. If he is in the 22% tax bracket in the future, it doesn't make any difference. It's the same amount. This is the first and you know, most basic way to look at uh, Roth versus tr traditional contributions. And you've no doubt you've heard this before. Maybe you haven't seen it laid out like this. But it's as simple as this. However, in reality, we know that predicting tax rates in the future um, is probably not something we're going to be able to do with a whole lot of confidence. So therefore, we have to sort of think about the whole context of where we are tax-wise. If we were, you know, if we were in the military, you know, we were a relatively new enlisted service member, where uh, we know that a large portion of our income is in the form of a non-taxable allowance, known as basic allowance for housing, we would realize at some point especially when we do our taxes, that our tax rate is really, really, really low. So therefore, it might be a great idea for us to pay tax on those contributions at that time because as we get older and we go up in the ranks or we leave the service and we get uh, you know, higher paying salaries as we get older and older and older until we get to the point where we're going to retire, we will have definitely, most, you know, in, in most cases that we can think about, would have been in a, a lower tax bracket at the very beginning of our military career. Now, that's kind of an extreme example. That one's easy to do uh, for you as a federal employee, perhaps at the beginning of your career, depending on, you know, the, uh, the grade and step that you came in. Perhaps you might uh, think that that's a similar scenario that applies to you, that at that point, it might be worthwhile to make Roth contributions and pay the tax currently so that you can kick the tax can, um, I'm sorry, you pay the tax at that point so that you, you, you don't kick, tick, kick, kick the tax can down the road and have to pay tax in the future. That might be the best thing. Uh, on the other hand, it may be that you get the point in your career where you're sort of at a point where you think that, uh, you know, if you retire and you need about like 80% of your uh, final year's uh, gross income in retirement in your first year was kind of the, the replacement formula that most of us apply when we think about retirement. You might think, oh, you know, I'm going to be having a, a less income need in retirement, so I'm probably going to be in a lower tax bracket. 
when I retire. So therefore, maybe I do want to kick that tax can down the road. On the other hand, you may be thinking, okay, I don't know what tax rates are going to do, and uh, I just know that they're probably not going to be the same as they are now. Maybe they'll be up, maybe they'll be down, I don't know. So I might choose to do both traditional and Roth contributions to sort of hedge my bets about what the future is going to hold. So in either case, I didn't make the complete wrong decision. I sort of, you know, compromising in between sort of half traditional and half Roth or whatever percentage of each that I think is, you know, appropriate for me. So therefore, in a large way, this choice is, uh, is sort of a guess, but it hinges around taxes, tax rate now and in the future. There is another aspect to this that has become much less important than it used to be, and it's because the tax law that was passed in 2007 increased the standard deduction for single individuals to $12,000 and for married couples to $24,000. So uh, you think back before that law was passed, many of you itemized when you did your taxes so that you could um, get a tax break that came from making traditional contributions, lowering your just gross income, which were, was tied to your deductions and certain tax credits, and it allowed you to take more full advantage of those deductions and credits because you itemized. So um, with the standard deduction, like if you're a married couple going up to $24,000, for a lot of you, your deductions don't exceed that. So therefore, you don't need to itemize um, and you just get the standard deduction anyway. So there may not be as much benefit, certainly for, for, for many of you, to uh, get that tax break today by lowering your adjusted gross income because that's standard deduction in terms of, you know, just looking at your tax uh, taxes for uh, the year. There's another thing to consider with this choice, and it hinges around the new withdrawal rules that the TSP has uh, uh, about to go into effect in September, and it involves being able to take withdrawals while you're still working. So when you reach age 59 and a half, under the current rules, you have an option to take a one-time withdrawal. And if you take that one-time withdrawal, it precludes you from taking a one-time post-service withdrawal. So I don't want to get into like that, into you know, explaining that in too much detail because this, these rules are about to go away, so they're not really going to matter anymore. But this has been. Uh, um, something that ha has been a real conundrum for people. Take that in-service withdrawal or, or not so they can take the partial post-service withdrawal. You won't be faced with that choice anymore. You'll be able to do up to four in-service withdrawals after the age of 59 and a half per year. So many of you are not going to be working past age 59 and a half. I know that, especially here. You know, A lot of you are going to be trying much earlier than that as law enforcement officers. But for those of you that are maybe don't fit, you know, that, not that, you know, in that position or, you know, maybe leave here and go to work at another federal agency, you know, you're not in that position. But uh, the point that I want to draw to here is that if you have the option to take withdrawals from Roth money at the age of 60, 61, 62, certainly your income is going to be for, you know, high. It's probably the highest point of your entire federal career. So therefore, if you're somebody who just happens to be thinking that I am going to be working past age 60, and now this is probably not the law enforcement officers, but uh, for those of you that aren't law enforcement officers, you're going to be thinking, I'm going to work past age 60. Maybe you might want to think about doing Roth contributions now because probably your salary in the future is going to be higher. So anyway, just something to think about. And uh, any questions with the regard to the Roth versus traditional? Hopefully we kind of ironed out some confusing things. Okay, we're going to move on here. Now here's the slide. We already kind of talked about this, but we said that the limit for making contributions to an IRA, especially a Roth IRA, a traditional IRA, same thing, is separate from the TSP's limit. We've already established that. What we didn't establish, and what's on this slide, is the fact that contributions that we make to a Roth IRA 
you know, not part of our employer plan, not part of the TSP, but those contributions are limited by our income. So once our adjusted gross income reaches 200, I think it's 203,000, we can't make any more Roth contributions. In fact, once we reach $193,000 of contribution, assuming we're married filing joint, the amount that we can contribute directly to our Roth IRA begins to be phased out. So, all right. Now, there are a lot of reasons, and we're going to talk about more here just in a few minutes about why we want to keep our money in the TSP and perhaps why if we, if we have other employer-based retirement plan money or other money in a traditional IRA, why it might be a good idea to bring that into the TSP. And we can do that. We can do that through a direct transfer, which is just simply that plan where we have that other money. It might be a 401k, it might be a 457b, SEP IRA, a simple, or a traditional IRA. We can have that plan sponsor transfer that money directly from them to our TSP account. It doesn't touch our hands. We don't, you know, we, we don't, it's not a taxable event. Uh, we don't have the opportunity to, to touch that money or to spend it. So there's a process to do that. Now, this includes Roth money, but not Roth IRAs. So what I mean by that is we may have a 401k, and that 401k accepts Roth contributions. And if it does, we can transfer those Roth contributions into our TSP. It'll go to our Roth bucket of our TSP. And the inception date that, you know, for the five-year rule that existed in that plan, it was, it's earlier than the date that we have in our TSP account currently, then that date's going to go into our TSP account. Now, that's a direct transfer. There's no uh, tax uh, that we're going to have to pay. It's not a taxable event. However, there's another way we can transfer money to the TSP, but this is actually not a transfer. It's a, it's a rollover. So this is where we take the money and we move it from uh, the other plan by taking a withdrawal. We take a withdrawal and uh, we have 60 days when we after we receive that money that we can take and send a check to the TSP. If we may, wait more than 60 days, then uh, the opportunity to move that into the TSP is gone. Now, uh, this is a withdrawal, so it means that if we're under 59 and a half, uh, and unless we meet another exception, there is an early withdrawal penalty that would apply to that money. But uh, I should back up here. I should have mentioned earlier that the uh, IRS has a standard federal income tax withholding with a lump sum withdrawal from a retirement plan, even if we're planning to roll the money over, and it's 20%. So this is a, a withholding. It's not necessarily a tax because we don't know what our tax bill is going to be until we file our taxes you know, after the, at the end of the year uh, and we add up all of our income and then we determine what our, our tax amount is. But if we take a withdrawal of, let's say, $100,000 in our other plan over there uh, under you know, we'll just SEP IRA or 401k, they're going to give us 80% um, of that. So if it's $100,000, we're going to get $80,000. $20,000 goes to the IRS as a withholding. But uh, we're going to be able to transfer or, and send that $80,000 that we've got over to the TSP, and that won't be taxable. But that $20,000 went to the IRS is fully taxable and subject to early withdrawal penalty. So an indirect rollover has a big pitfall. And normally, people that do indirect rollovers understand that this is the process, this is the taxes, and they do it because they want to access some of that money. So instead of sending that $80,000 over to the TSP, they may take $20,000 and go buy a car with it. And then $60,000 goes to the TSP. So therefore, $40,000 is going to be taxable in that calendar year. Now, this obviously takes some, some prior planning, maybe some financial planning around their, their budget and other uh, financial issues that they have, but you can do that. But if you're just planning to move money from one plan to another, 
then uh, probably you want to do a direct transfer, that, which is the one illustrated at the top of this slide. And in either case, it involves completing a withdrawal form. So in the first case, it might not seem like a withdrawal, uh, but technically it is. You would complete the withdrawal form that's associated with that plan sponsor. And on that withdrawal form, you would mark the block that says transfer. And then you would fill in the information about the TSP, including the address of where they send that money. Um, you would also send a TSP-60 form or a TSP-60R form if you're having them move Roth money. That's what the R stands for. And then they would uh, sign that form. And when they send that money to the TSP, that 60 or 60R form goes along with that transfer of money so that we can see that to verify that that plan sponsor is certified that this is eligible retirement plan money. If we don't have that 60 form, you know, we'll, you know, we'll let you know and we'll have to return that money because we have to have proof to certify that that's eligible retirement plan money. So that's in either, either case. So questions with uh, doing transfers. So for some of you, this may be on existing money. For some of you, maybe future money. It may be when you leave the DEA, you go work someplace else and you get a 401k and you accrue money in there. Later on, when you leave that employer, then you can do this transfer into the TSP. So questions? Questions? No? All right. All right. So does anyone have a Uniform Services TSP account in addition to your federal civilian TSP account? So some of you do. Okay. All right. So you can combine those accounts because right now you have two separate accounts. And if you like, you can uh, take those, uh, uh, all that money that's in your Uniform Services account, move it into your federal civilian TSP account, uh, make things simpler. However, you might decide that you don't want to do that uh, for a number of reasons. But uh, one thing uh, to be aware of is that the tax-exempt money that you have in your Uniform Services account, if you have any, when you were deployed to a combat zone, you got uh, tax-exempt money in there. That can't be transferred into your federal civilian TSP account. Everything else can, but, but that money can't. So you can decide if you want to take a withdrawal of that money or, or leave the, the account separate. The advantage of this is going to be simplifying your accounts, easier to manage. Uh, just one all, you know, allocation uh, that you're looking at. Another uh, a drawback to that, or maybe an advantage to keeping them separate is that if you've separated from the uniform services, you have access to that money by, by taking withdrawals uh, much easier than if, you, if you're uh, working and taking in-service withdrawals. Because your only option before age 59 and a half is going to be either a loan or a um, hardship withdrawal. And they, you know, both of those come with uh, some drawbacks, which we'll explore in just a, a little bit. Uh, but you know, if you want to keep that money, you can always combine it later on. There's no deadline for, for when you uh, have to do that. OK. so. We're, we're about to go into the, the second half of the, this uh, session here. Let's see, I've got, uh, I've got about 10 minutes to 11. Phyllis, do, you know, can I, do we need to take a break, or should we just press on? I'll leave it up to you. Uh, yeah, let's take a break and okay. uh, come back at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, OK. Take a quick break. So we'll see you at 11 o'clock.
We are back. So we, we may have lost some folks, or maybe they're still taking a break. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and start, because we said 11 o'clock. So I think we're, we're okay to start right now. All right, so what I want to do is go through the design of the TSP in terms of, you know, how do we put this plan together to help participants achieve a large balance at the end of their careers? So what is involved in that? And then we're going to take a look at the individual funds. And you'll have to bear with me a little bit because we're going to take a, a little bit of a, uh, a dive into what an index fund is because that's what the TSP is built on. The four, four of the core funds at least are built on uh, the basis of uh, index funds. And so it's important to understand what those are, how they work, and then you can see the passive nature of the plan and uh, hopefully you'll be able to get a better feel for what kind of asset allocation is going to make sense for you. So we'll look at historical returns and we'll look at uh, expenses and we'll look at the life cycle funds. So we'll look at the whole big picture of the funds. And we're going to begin by talking about the fundamental basis that uh, this plan is designed around. But before I talk about that, let's just kind of think about what we're trying to accomplish. We had the three-legged stool up there a few, uh, well, it seems like an hour and a half or two hours ago about. And uh, we saw that that thrift savings plan leg is important. We can't just neglect it and we can't just uh, assume we're going to have enough money to live on that it's, you know, we can take a lot of risk in our TSP account by um, just investing uh, uh, through all, in all the equities and expect that uh, we're not going to have any kind of volatility. We're, we're, we are going to have volatility because that's what the market does. So we don't want to take a lot of risk uh, because it's not like we're going to Las Vegas and we're, you know, we might take a $500 with us to Las Vegas uh, as our kind of entertainment money and we gamble on that. And when, we, when that money runs out, we just, we're done. And we're just like, okay, that was our... That was our entertainment money, and uh, it was fun, and so it's no big loss. But with your TSP account, you're not certainly not going to invest over all these years and be willing to take a big loss at the end of your career and say, okay, well, it was a fun just investing in the TSP, even though I don't have you know, enough to, to retire on. That's, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to be reasonably assured that we're going to have you know, X number of dollars in our account. So we do some calculations and we use some you know, projected rates of return. We make guesses about that, how many years we're going to be investing and what our salary increases are going to be like and how much this is going to add to our account. Because we're trying to project out how much we're going to have in our account by a certain age so that at that age we can retire and go into the next phase of our lives. So. The name of the game with long-term retirement investing, whether it's TSP or we're in another private sector 401k plan, is risk mitigation. And we do that by diversifying among different investments to try to bring that risk down over the long term. And over the long term, we know that we can benefit from the long-term trend of the market, which is going to be upward from the, you know, if we're looking at a graph, it's going to be from the lower left to the upper right. So first of all, diversification is where we're trying to invest in as many different kinds of investment as, as we possibly can. So whether it's the asset class, meaning bonds versus equities, or it's the differences among and between those asset classes. For example, with the bond class, we're going to invest in Corporate bonds of big and small companies, medium-sized companies. We're going to invest in asset-backed securities, government bonds, long-term, short-term, medium-term, foreign and domestic. We're also, uh, within the equities, we want to invest in big 
medium, small companies, companies that would be considered to be growth or companies that are considered to be value and everything in between. We want to invest in companies that are in all sectors of the market, whether the, the financial sector, healthcare, energy, technology, everything. We want to be spread across the entire investable market, foreign and domestic. So the reason for that is it reduces the risk because of the correlations that exist between those, those stocks and, be, and between the bonds as well. Because when certain conditions in the market, whether they're caused by you know, the economics or the, you know, the politics or world events, you know, some of those events uh, may tend to cause some of those investments to go up. And some other investments tend to move at the, in, the, in the same direction up or down, they tend to move together because those conditions in general have the same impact. Some of them have the opposite impact. They tend to have a, they, they move in opposite directions. Some of them don't have any relationship to one another. But we have thousands and thousands of different investments. So the combination of all those investments means that uh, they're never going to be too hot and never going to be too cold. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. That's reducing volatility. So we spread that out in order to reduce the risk of losing a lot all in a very short period of time. Now it's going to tamp down the gains as well, but we want to reduce the risk. So we got to have a trade-off there. We have a balance there. So we know, again, that the long-term trend of the market is up. That's why we invest in the stock market. So we're getting the benefit of that long-term trend but without a lot of risk and a lot of speculation. So we're not expecting to be hitting home runs every, you know, every week or every month or every year. We're going to have some years where the numbers are sort of down, some years where they're up. But it's all going to average out to you know, a reasonable mean, which is going to help us achieve our retirement goals. So this is a different style of investing than you might be thinking about when you you know, you might watch uh, some of the, the financial shows on TV where uh, they're talking about uh, looking at the fundamental numbers and choosing various companies because their their balance sheet or because of the news going on with that company. And, uh, you know, you, you invest in that company and you take the risk and you hope for the best. We're not doing the same thing with the TSP. That's a little bit different. So we achieve diversification, uh, first of all, by being invested in index investment funds. So to understand what an index investment fund is, we have to look at what an index is. So this is, uh, this might, uh, this little graph here, or this is actually a, a, a chart, I guess you can call it, or graphic. Uh, might be a little bit taxing on the eyes here at first, but let me explain what this is. This is a heat map of the S&P 500 index. And the S&P 500 index is a list of the largest 505 companies in the United States that are publicly traded. And by publicly traded, we mean it has shares of stock that you can buy and sell on the stock market. And this graphic came off of a website called finviz.com, and I got the reference down there. And it's a great website if you want to learn about investing, especially in terms of uh, investing in indexes. But if we break this down a little bit, we, see, we can see a little bit more detail here. You can see that uh, there's uh, all these squares, and uh, you might be able to count them very easily, but there's 505 squares. If I had this on my computer screen, I could expand it. And then you can see with each of those squares are some letters, and that's the, the ticker. That ticker designates, or it's like the label of the company that is represented by that square. And you might recognize, and it's kind of easy to, to tell, you know, there's Apple, there's Google, there's uh, App, uh, Amazon, uh, there's JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, kind of the lower left, uh, Visa, or Verizon, I'm sorry, Verizon. Uh, you know, Visa, Verizon's different, sorry about that. There's Disney over there I can see. I can see Johnson & Johnson, I can see Home Depot, I can see Exxon. So these are broken up into the economic sectors that, uh, you know, that they fall into. But overall, it's just a list of the largest 500 companies in the United States. And as a heat map, it's showing you uh, for that company, 
if the share price of that company's stock went up from what it was at the open of the market at 9.30 to, and I took this about midday, about noon. And so if it's up, it's green. If it's down, it's red. You know, the more it's up, the more it's green. The more it's down, the more it's red. The size of those squares depict the size of that company in relationship to all the rest. But the size is measured by what's called market capitalization. So that means it's the number of shares of that company's stock that's available to be treated, traded on any market day. So right now, how many shares are, are freely traded of, of Amazon or of, of Apple or, or whatever the company we're talking about? And we multiply that share number, that quantity of shares, by the share price. And that gives us the market capitalization of the company. So this is how we measure the size of a company when we look at it in terms of the stock market. So if you think about this little graph here, or this little chart, you've got all 505 companies based on their size relative to that index, whether it's up or down for that particular day. So it's in all sectors of the market. So where, where, what do they have in common? What they have in common is really just that they're the largest companies in the US. In fact, these companies are so large that all together, these 505 companies um, make up 82% of the entire um, US economy. So all the trading that's done is, uh, you know, amounts to 82% of the US stock market. So this is a great proxy to tell us how the US stock market is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. This is why we follow it. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, there's only 18% of, you know, publicly traded companies that are not in the SP 500. So this is actually what we use for our C fund. We track the SP 500. In fact, we don't just track it, we replicate it. What that means is our investment manager, BlackRock, which holds the, uh, all the shares for the four um, index investment funds, they hold a portfolio of all 505 companies in the same proportions as those companies exist in the actual index. So we're not investing you know, directly in the index. We're investing in a portfolio that has all the shares in the same proportions as the index. So when the SP 500 goes up, our C fund shares go up and vice versa. Now it's kind of a tough job because when they do it, when they invest this way, you know that uh, because of the market movement and the correlations that exist between all these different um, companies, some go up, some go down. At the end of the market day, the portfolio that BlackRock holds for us, which is our C fund, is now out of kilter. It's out of balance with what the actual index is. So what they do is they make trades at the close of the market day so that some of the stocks that went up and now we're long on, um, so, well, when they went up, that means we've got to buy them. So we're, we're short. Our portfolio is short compared to the index. Now, some of those companies' share prices went down, so now we're long on those stocks. And we've got we to sell them so that we can get our portfolio back where it's in perfect replication of the S&P 500 index itself. <clears throat> so this is a passive style of investing. The TSP only has index funds that allow passive investing. We don't have any active funds where we have managers that are um, making decisions about which stocks to buy, which stocks to sell based on data, like fundamental data, technical data, there's a lot of other data. We don't do any of that. We just simply track indexes, just like I explained. So there's not a lot of stress involved. It's just a basic computer-based, and we're just replicating that index. So 
this is um, how we achieve diversification with the TSP. And we, we go beyond this. And so we're going to take a look at the funds and individually, and then we'll see the other indexes and how this contributes to the overall diversification of your, uh, your fund choices in the TSP. The first fund that we have there is the Orange G Fund. That is not an index fund. It is a stable value uh, government security. It's a fixed income security which means that uh, the U.S. Treasury issues G Fund securities to our TSP account each and every pay period that, you know, if we're investing in the G Fund, we're buying G Fund shares each pay period. And the G Fund shares that are in our account have uh, an interest rate that the Treasury calculates and applies to the growth of those shares. And this calculation is uh, done on the last business day of each month. Heck. Today, today the Treasury is doing the G Fund calculation, and then uh, we'll know on. I guess we'll know tomorrow. So yeah, it'll it'll be on the TSP website, and you're looking at what's new. It'll, you'll see that it'll be published. In fact, it'll probably be published today, but not that you'll see it and you won't pay attention to it. But um, it'll be on the website uh, probably at the end of the day today. But it's based on the average weighted return of all U.S. Treasury securities that have a maturity date that's four to 30 years. So there's U.S. Treasury securities that have a maturity date 90 days all the way to 30 years. But we're only looking at the ones from four to 30 years. So it's kind of an intermediate maturity all the way to a long-term maturity uh, for those bonds that are way out there at 30 years. So the longer the maturity, the, the better the, the rate of return. So we get the average weighted return, and uh, I think for the month of April, I might be wrong here. I don't always uh, have this number in my head, but it should be about 2.5%, 2.65%. Uh, we could look that up quite easily, but um, it's similar to the 10-year Treasury yield, if you want to follow that, but it's not exactly the same thing. Now, the G Fund security is unique to the TSP because uh, it is a rate that we get with no risk of negative returns that's far better than the rate that applies on money market accounts that are outside of the TSP, like 401ks and so forth. The rate that you get in a money market is going to be similar to what you get in your bank um, checking account or savings account. Um, so it's a stable value, you know, just like the money market, but at a, a significantly higher rate. And this is only for TSP participants. It's not something that you can get in a, in a in a player plan somewhere. So this is why when I was talking about the G fund earlier, I kind of highlighted this. Uh, and it and it is true that for a lot of you that are younger, you don't have a whole lot of your portfolio allocated to the G fund, which is probably a, a you know fine. You know nothing wrong with that. But as you get older, and maybe you want to de-risk how much uh, uh, your, your account is exposed to possible market losses. You know, the G Fund's going to have a, a, a greater uh, part of your portfolio and have more importance to you. But to uh, be able to have the benefit of the G Fund as over the private sector alternatives is really a significant aspect of the TSP that, that you can't overlook. Now we're going to look at the index fund. So, all uh, four of these, the FC, S, and I are all index funds. The first one is a bond fund. It is kind of similar to the G fund in a way, uh, but not totally the same thing. Because bonds now, we're talking mostly corporate bonds, where we're loaning money to corporations, and then they pay us a set interest rate while we hold the bond, and then a maturity at the end. But in reality, in the F fund, what we have is about 10,000 different kinds of bonds. They include corporate bonds, big, small, medium-sized companies, all sectors of the market, but also government bonds and uh, asset-backed securities like mortgages. About 75% of the F fund is triple A, uh, very highly rated, and the rest is only just a, a, a notch below that. So we have great, diver great diversification within the F fund. However, uh, the F fund is unique from the equities funds because the 
risk that's associated with bonds is, is interest rates. And as interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So you, some of you are very familiar with that. And uh, you know that uh, it's just a matter of fact that in the, um, in the economy that we have in the United States, we have very low interest rates. We've had lower interest rates for, for quite a while now. And we've never really been at a point in our economic history where we've had interest rates this low for this long. And as such, we generally think that the interest rates are, uh, I mean, the, in the short term, they can, they can do a lot of things. And, and, and bonds, there's a lot of factors that affect bonds. But uh, the most important risk associated with bonds is interest rates. So long term, we project, uh, you know, there's only really one direction that we can reasonably expect interest rates to go. Maybe it won't go that much this calendar year. The Fed has told us that the interest rates are not going to be um, um, going. They're not going to be. They're not going to be raising inter interest rates this year, but eventually. So this is why, um, if you look at the life cycle funds, you'll see the importance that the um, the design of the life cycle funds puts on the F fund. We have a very small sliver of the F fund. No matter which one we choose, is in the F fund, and it has to do with the fact that the um, interest rates of the economy are, are low right now. The C fund we just talked about. It's the SP 500 that we're replicating there, about 82% of the U.S. economy. We move over to the S fund, and it's the other 18%. So everything that's not in the C fund is in the S fund. That is, the, that is publicly traded companies. Now, we don't have uh, companies with shares of stock that uh, sell for less than a dollar. Those are penny stocks. It wouldn't be worth it for BlackRock to uh, trade those stocks. But uh, between the C and the S funds, we have diversification across the entire U.S. stock market. And notice uh, it's perfect diversification because there's no overlaps, because there's no company that exists in both of these indexes. And there's no gaps, with the exception of penny stocks. But we're not interested in the penny stocks. But we're not missing Exxon and Disney or Home Depot. You know, they're in one or the other. Um, REITs, real estate investment trusts. We're not missing real estate investment trusts because those are publicly traded. If they're, if they're you know, part of a big company, uh, they're in the C fund. If they're part of a medium to small company, they're in the S fund. We have everything. We have perfect diversification in the U.S. stock market between the C and the S funds. But then we add to that uh, the I fund, which is... Uh, a index that tracks large company stocks in the developed market. In fact, uh, it's 21 countries. Uh, most of uh, the investment is in Japan. But uh, we have uh, investments uh, in Great Britain and in Australia, the, f the Far East, uh, Europe. And uh, it's 920 large companies. An example of a large company that's headquartered outside the US is Toyota. So in our IFN, we have Toyota. We have lots of other other companies in there too that uh, that are based overseas. The I fund adds uh, sort of uh, the international diversification. We're going to replace the I fund that's based on the Morgan Stanley Capital International EFEA with uh, a Morgan Stanley Capital International um, ACWI or All World Capital International. And you can, uh, if you wanted to look that up uh, as a fund, you can find it on the Yahoo Finance as an ETF. But uh, this is, this is a, uh, uh, an index that tracks about 6,400 companies. And so big as well as medium and small, smaller emerging markets. So we're going to be even much more diversified in about a year or so when this uh, transition takes place where we replace the existing uh, I fund uh, benchmark with a, with a new one. So there's the lineup. You can see it's only five core funds. We have both domestic coverage, international coverage. We have stable value. We have bonds. We have uh, big company stocks, small company stocks, international stocks in every sector of the market. So it's this um, that I'm talking about when I reference diversification. So earlier I said one of the advantages of the TSP is it's simple but elegant design. And uh, people will, will say, uh, Something like, well, the TSP only has five funds to choose from, so that means you can't get diversification. It's uh, just a crazy statement. It's not true. It's, uh, it's you know, people that uh, want to 
try to push their own uh, financial products uh, that would make that kind of a comparison. But for the most part, people understand, you know, this really makes a lot of sense. So let's take a look at the returns of these funds historically. We're going to take a look at the uh, returns uh, in two different ways. I want to first look at the returns based on a year-to-year -year basis. So I want, to look at the, I want to separate the years out individually and look at which funds performed the best over the last 11 years. So it's going to be in this chart. This is, I know this is a little bit of an eye strain. If you're colorblind, it might be a little bit of a challenge, but uh, don't worry. I'm gonna, I've had broken down by the individual fund. So this is just the composite of everything all together. But let me explain what we're looking at here. We've got uh, 11 vertical columns beginning with 2008. And then I've got the funds performance for that particular year listed in descending order underneath uh, the, the, the year at the top in the heading. And the colors correspond to the colors we use in the website and in our pu printed publications, except for the F. I made the F a little bit uh, lighter red because uh, it was, it's really hard to see with that black print and then the red color. But uh, we're going to look year to year the performance of these funds. And you can see I've got all five core funds and I've got another fund in there, which is the L2040, the life cycle fund, because I wanted to compare that and see how that fit among all five. So here's the G fund. So the G fund returns are fairly small, not much variation from year to year, but there's no negative symbols in front of those numbers, so that means there's no negative returns. So what we want to try to identify here is the risk associated with investing in the G fund, and then the returns associated with, with investing in the G fund. And what's going to become apparent is that we can't have one without the other. We can't have high returns without high risk. And we can't have, uh, and if we want low risk, we're going to end up with low returns. So that's the case here with the G fund. Now, the F fund, we see a little bit of a difference. We see some of the numbers are higher, but we still see one number, at least on this chart, that shows a negative symbol in front of the returns for 2013. But generally, over the last 11 years, the F fund has done better than the G fund. But not every year. C fund, there again, we look at uh, risk. We, we might just say we, we're going to measure risk by counting the number of times the, G, the C fund had a negative return. And there are two that I count on this chart. But as far as returns go, we can't help but notice that the C fund is in the top position once. It's in the second position five times. And in the fourth, excuse me, the third position four times. Even though Last year, it was in the third position, but it was a negative. So it gives us some, um, some clear picture about the risk associated with the C fund. The S fund is kind of similar, but uh, the S fund is in the very top position. In other words, it was the best returning fund four of those 11 years. And it was the second best fund two of those 11 years. But Four of those years, it was either in the second from the bottom or the very bottom position and it had negative returns all those years. In fact, we can see the negatives range from negative 38 to negative 3.38, negative 2.92, and negative 9.26 last year. So again, if we want high returns, we've got to accept high risk. If we want low risk, we've got to accept low returns, so in general. How about the I fund? I fund's kind of all over the map. Uh, we got two years where the I fund performed the best out of all five core funds. We've got four years where the I fund was the lowest performing fund. In fact, all four of those years, it had negative returns. So it's important to get kind of a handle on this risk return relationship that exists on all the core funds. So for this reason, we can diversify by putting these funds together in 
fund of funds, that is life cycle funds. So the life cycle funds are a composite of all five core funds. And in particular, I'm looking at the L2040 fund. Now the L2040 fund is generally the fund for the age cohort that plans to start taking their money out of the TSP in retirement when, they're, um, when that's between say 2035 and 2045. So we're generally when you're in, you're in five, within five years of, of uh, that um, year for which the fund is named, that's when you're taking the money out, that, that would be the fund for you. So this gives you some idea, it makes sense that these funds um, are going to, you know, when you're diversified by combining those core funds, you're going to smooth out that volatility. And that's just what we've done here. It's not too hot, not too cold. So we've got the index funds diversifying, and then we get the life cycle funds. We put this together in a portfolio where we mix them all together, and we further diversify it. So here is what we started off with. Looks kind of like a kaleidoscope of colors there. But those return numbers that you see on this chart, if I were to ask you, if you look at the green numbers, which is the C fund, you might think that those numbers should be pretty much the same as the return numbers for the S&P 500 for those 11 years. Because of what I explained earlier, that we're tracking or replicating that index. But the truth is, those numbers that you see here for the TSP returns for the C fund and the S fund specifically, and the F fund as well, are higher than the indexes that they track. You might wonder how that can be because, of course, we have to take expenses out of, of your returns. But those returns, those percentages, are not just the capital gains. Those returns include um, interest income for the, for the F fund specifically. They include dividend income it's for the C and the S specifically. Uh, because some of those companies pay dividends. And when they pay dividends, they're not going to send a dividend and check to, to you because you own shares in the TSP. They're going to send it to BlackRock because they hold those shares. And they're going to take and calculate and add those dividends into the share prices. So that calculates not just the capital gains, it adds the share prices in there. So that increases the value of that share price. Then the last thing that's added into the TSP funds to make the share prices what they are is securities lending income. So we have about $600 billion worth of assets in the TSP. A lot of it's in the G fund, but, but the, the bigger portion is split between those uh, other funds. So we have the ability to, to loan those shares to investors, and usually it's overnight loans that uh, pay us rent. Uh, we take collateral from them. We hold that collateral on the G fund, which is returning at the you know, safe G fund rate. And then uh, they do whatever they want they, with those shares. But they return those shares at the end of that period of time that they're renting them. And they pay us the, the, the rent, uh, so to speak. We've earned money off the, the collateral that they gave us to hold those shares. So there's no risk to any TSP participants, but it generates a lot of income. So because the TSP is so large, a lot of the income that comes from securities lending um, really makes a big difference. And so we add that into the share prices as well. And we see that the returns that we have in the TSP are significantly higher than the indexes. I'd say, well, they're, they're higher than the indexes. I mean, there's, significant is a relative term. For the I fund, uh, for the most case, you know, that's true. But there is a uh, risk factor associated with investing in overseas um, stocks. Uh, attached to currency exchange rates. So currency exchange rates fluctuate, and so that is another risk factor. So sometimes um, we don't see the consistent you know, return of a TSP index investment fund being higher than the index that it's tracking. So there's the, the low expenses, and people sometimes point to, well, you should invest um, instead of the TSP, if you have a good chance to go outside the TSP, you should invest in you know, this IRA over here because they have an index IRA that they've got the expense ratio pegged at something below the expense ratio of the TSP. Okay, that's fine. But what about the returns? Do you have securities lending uh, to the degree that we have? Uh, so there's two sides of that. 
So the, ca the case is usually that, they, of course, that they don't. Well, they just don't. So let's look at the expenses now. Uh, we talked about uh, this just kind of in general terms earlier, but as you know, the TSP expenses are very low. How low are they? We have a gross expense ratio, but we do a couple of things with the TSP to try to bring that down. The thing that has the most impact is the employees that stay uh, as federal employees for less than three years and they leave. And after 30 days, like I said, their agency automatic contributions and the earnings attached to those contributions are forfeited back to the TSP. And then they're used to offset administrative costs. So this brings our net expense ratio down by quite a bit. And we have it listed here across all of the funds, including the life cycle funds. And it is uh, an average of 0.04%, which um, we sometimes call that uh, uh, four basis points. So it's really, really, really cheap. And I'll show you how cheap that is in just a minute. But the other expenses that are listed there is what we pay BlackRock to manage our index funds. Now, we have to pay them. That's our contractor that we have. But what they return to us far exceeds what we pay them because of the securities lending that they do for us and because of the way they calculate the share prices to include dividend income, the way they track the the share is the way I explained. So this is a service that is, is very valuable. And uh, you know the TSP assets being over, you know, around, I think, I'm pretty sure they're over 600 billion by now. Um, it, it's, it's a big job and, it's, and it has a lot of value for us. So um, the expense ratio, we wanna compare to try to get our minds wrapped around how, how cheap this really is. So this study references looking uh, a, a study that looked at the expense ratios of 401k plans in the United States. They looked at over 500 plans, and you can see the footnote on the slide there. But what they determined was the expense ratio of the average 401k plan. Now they're this is kind of a bell curve. There's there's outliers, but in the middle of the bell curve, the expense ratio is $4.10 per $1,000 of account balance per year. Versus the TSP, we said it was 0.04%. It equates to $0.40 cents per $1,000 of account balance per year. So if your account balance is very small, then it's not gonna make a whole lot of difference. But the larger your account balance, and then the more years you have that money in the TSP, the more of a difference it's going to make. So, in this chart, I'm comparing two different scenarios. One where I'm taking a period of 10 years, and then on the bottom, I'm taking a period of 30 years. So over on the top chart to the left, I take $10,000, put it in my TSP account, leave it there for 10 years, and I wanna compare what my ending balance after 10 years is compared with a average 401k plan, given a rate of return uh, on average of 6%. So we see the difference there is about $613 more in my TSP account than the 401k plan that has that higher expense ratio. If I look in the bottom bar graph, go all the way over to the right, I can see that the difference um, on a $200,000 balance held over 30 years is really a lot. It's about $113,000 difference. So again, it just tells the story that the larger my account balance, the longer the period of time, the more benefit I'm going to get from those low expense ratios uh, that we enjoy with the TSP. Now, we looked at the returns of the TSP's core funds on a year-to-year -year basis, but now I want to look at the returns on an aggregate over time basis. And we'll look at them individually again. First of all, let's look at the G fund from 2003 up till the end of last year. We begin at $10 because I, I chose to start my chart at 2003 because we 
reset the share prices to $10 a share back in 2003. So it gives us a good point of reference where we're all starting from the same point. So notice here, the same picture of risk and return. Not a whole lot of risk, but then again, not a whole lot of return. The F fund, we did uh, a little better, especially after about 2009. But we have some volatility there. We saw that volatility on our earlier chart on a year-to-year -year basis. We ended a little bit higher than the G fund. Now, up to the left on that scale, that's the share price. So that's what we're looking at, share prices. Now let's look at the C fund. That's the green line. The C fund started off at $10 back in the 2008, 2009 period. We dipped all the way down to about $8 a share. He went off my chart there. We came back, and there's a lot of volatility up and down, up and down, up and down. Last year, about September 22nd, we kind of hit the peak, and we fell off the kind of the, the cliff there, and we ended the year with lower share prices, significantly lower share prices than we, we had back in September. On September 22nd, I think it was the peak. But uh, we have sort of a similar story with the S fund. That's the blue line. Blue line is even you know, more volatility there. Look at that. You can see it's similar movement to the C fund, but these are smaller companies, a little bit more risk there, a little bit more potential for positive returns. We saw that on the year-to-year -year chart. But uh, we ended up uh, at the end of the year, same story as the C fund. September 22nd was sort of the bellwether date. We wish we'd have moved all to the G fund. We didn't know. But we kept our, our money invested in the, in the S fund. And the share prices went down and down and down and down until the end of the year. And then we had uh, the uh, I fund, kind of a similar story, but on a, a much smaller scale. The I fund was doing uh, much better than the C and the S funds all the way up until about 2008, which at which point it really uh, sort of kind of going went sideways. You had some volatility, but it sort of ended up uh, going sideways for the the most of the the rest of this uh, you know 10 year period. And we see at the end of 2018, it also went down uh, significantly after September. But what's the story of equities um, since January 1st? We've, we've really returned back to the levels we were in September. In fact, I think today I looked at the market, we're down just a little bit. But as of Monday, we got right back to the share prices that we had uh, in the C, S, and I funds uh, that were back in September. So we've, we've, we've recovered all the way back uh, from that loss that we had at the end of the last year. Now what I wanted to do here was I wanted to show how these returns compare with sort of what we might, we often use average annual returns over periods of time. Uh, so those are sort of unrealistic looking backwards, but it's the only thing we can do going forward is, is just project out average annual returns. But if you had an average annual return of 6% over this entire 15-year period, what would that look like? Well, there it is. It would have ended up with a uh, lower share price than even the I fund. So the I fund, basically what you can say, has a, over that 15-year period, had an average annual rate of return of just a little bit north of 6%. How about 8%? 8% ends up a little bit above the I fund, a little bit below the C fund. How about 10%? So look at 10%. 10% gives us, all, for coincidentally, almost the same average annual rate of return that we had in the S fund over that uh, entire 15-year entire period. So looking at this, I think you can see a number of different um, key things that stand out. One of them is probably going to be long-term value of staying diversified. Because the trend is from the lower left to the upper right. There's volatility. It's up and down, up and down. S fund, more volatility than C. You know, F, more volatility than G. You know, we can try to be safe, so to speak, and stay in the G fund, but you can see what the result's going to be, is you're just going to not end up with a whole lot of returns altogether. So we also saw earlier that with that kind of periodic table looking chart, it makes sense to diversify, not just because we have those index funds, but diversify between the funds that the TSP has 
and do something like the life cycle funds. Because again, it's going to dampen down the volatility and uh, we're going to benefit from the long-term growth of the market. So let's take a look at the life cycle funds and to see how they're a combination of all five core funds. We have the uh, pie charts listed here from the upper right 2050 fund. We go to the left to the 2040 fund, the 2030 fund, and then we go back down to the L2020 fund and then to the L income fund. And you can see the movement there is gradually reducing the amount of the C, the S, and the I and increasing the amount of the G. So if you were to choose a life cycle fund from the offerings that the TSP has, you would be able to um, just kind of sit back and let it do its thing because it's going to readjust every quarter so that it dials down the risk by increasing G fund over time. So as you get closer and closer to retirement, when you can least afford to have your account balance be depleted by a big market correction, you're going to be protected by having more and more of your balance in the G fund. Here is the uh, overall um, plan, and that is, is you know, basically the more time you have until you start you know, taking distributions from your account, the more risk you can afford to take. And so therefore, the more return you expect to have. And so therefore, we're trying to achieve a balance between risk and return. So that's kind of what that's illustrating. Interesting. I'm going to kind of skip the discussion of the G fund. Uh, and I'm not going to go into as much detail because I'm just looking at the time. And I've, I've, I'm, uh, I'm running a little bit behind. I want to make sure I cover everything. Now, this chart, you know, if you receive the um, slides, you know, electronically, you can print this out. Some of you already, you know, have it right here. You've you got the handout that Phyllis printed out, and you've got this chart, and you can use this sort of as a gauge to see how you're doing in your management of your account by going in and looking at uh, the returns that you have on a year-to-year -year basis. So you log into your account, look at your fourth quarter statements or your annual statements. You can write down your personal rate of return in the, in the U column, and then go across and compare with the returns for uh, the life cycle funds associated with your, uh, what would be your age cohort when you plan to start taking the money out. Now it's not, adult, it's not a real clear um, apples to apples comparison, but it's sort of in the ballpark and it might give you some idea and maybe give you some motivation to go in and make the transactions that you need to get your account uh, allocated in the way that you think is, is going to be more efficient for you. So the two, transi two transactions you can do on the website uh, when you log in are a contribution allocation where you tell the TSP when new money comes into my account, put it into these funds. And the interfund transfer is where you take your existing balance, whatever that mix is, and you move it among the funds that you want it to be in. For example, if you're 50% G fund and 50% C fund, maybe you want to choose to be in a life cycle fund. You'd inter interfund transfer, and you choose a life cycle fund, you can just put 100% of your balance in life cycle fund, and at the end of the market day, we're going to make that, um, that, that move, and then so you start the next day, you'll be all in the, the life cycle fund or however you want to do it. There's no cost to do these interfund transfers. You're limited to two per calendar month, um, which even after that, you can move between the funds as long as you're moving into the G, uh, the G fund. All right, yes, ma'am. So I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite, can you repeat the question? I didn't quite hear everything. No, the question is about the uh, allocation of your funds and what's the best way to monitor that. I know, it, you know, for the average uh, federal employee, you know, we're, we're relying on that. But it seems like you have to really have a deep background to look for the market to rise, to look for the market to drop without just having to constantly watch that. So I'm just asking what's the best way to monitor that, to okay. make sure your funds are allocated properly to maximize your contributions? Well, the life cycle funds are, are a really good way to do that because they, they, they do it for you. So they just gradually dial down the risk because they become 
more weighted in G fund and less in the CSNI. But if you wanted to use the core funds and just do it yourself, you, I mean, you're, there's lots of ways you can do it. You can just use the L funds as sort of a model. Maybe you want to have it a little bit different, but just uh, maybe quarterly, you make a little bit of an adjustment. Um, but what you certainly would not want to do is try to react to what the market's doing. You know, the, the market falls, now you're moving everything into G, and the market goes up, and then you move everything into S, and then the market falls, you move everything. So you just, what uh, I had in the first, one of the first slides is that's a losing strategy. That's a strategy that's going to give you, if you did this, you know, people that move their money like that are going to find that they're, um, performance is going to be way underperforming the actual life cycle funds. Okay, so, so I think uh, if you're if you get panicked and you get worried, okay, the market's moving, it's really doing this, it's doing that. Um, you uh, got to keep your eye on the goal. If you get in a plane at uh, Washington Reagan National Airport and you're headed to San Diego, you're going to fly over. I don't know. You're going to fly over West Virginia and Kentucky and. Who knows, Missouri and Oklahoma, I don't know, we're going to fly over a bunch of states, but you don't really care, you know, you, you look out the window of the airplane, you can't even see those states because the clouds, you know, it's too far away, but uh, you're, you're concerned about what the weather's like in San Diego, so you're packed for San Diego. So the same thing is when you begin your retirement investing as a federal employee, you know, it doesn't really matter two years, three years, five years, you know, tomorrow, next week, you know, whatever, you're focused on when I retire. That's when it matters. So that's why you have a, a, a strategy that's just, you know, a coherent strategy is just gradually, you know, for most people it's going to be dialing down the risk gradually over time and not making sudden movements. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah. I think I, I need to kind of push on here a little bit. I am going to hit to the, kind of the high points here. I've got just a few minutes left. Loans and in-service withdrawals. You can take a loan out of your TSP account where you borrow from your own contributions and earnings. There's a limit to the amount that you can borrow. For anybody and everybody, the limit's $50,000, except for you're limited to your own contributions and earnings. So if your account balance is less than that, then you would have you know, less of a limit. Now, uh, when you take out a loan, you're going to have to pay it back through payroll deduction. So uh, you can uh, go into the website. You can fill out how much you want to borrow, and then indicate how, what your payments you want your payments to be. As long as those payments, pay that loan off within five years, you're good to go. We'll send it to your payroll office, and then they're going to take the payments out of your check. They're going to charge you a interest rate. The interest rate's going to be set at the G fund rate at the time the loan is processed. And all that money, even that interest that you pay on it, is going to go into your TSP account and it can be divided among the funds that you've you've allocated your your uh, contributions to go into. Uh, we charge a loan fee of 50 bucks, no matter what your loan cost is or what your loan disbursement is. And a general purpose loan, you don't need any particular reason. You borrow the money; it's your money. You can you know you can borrow it if you want. Um, but we do have another type of loan called a residential loan, where you can borrow up to the same amount, $50,000, and uh, you have up to 15 years to pay it back, so you can make your payments smaller. Now, even with that type of loan, you can change the amount of your monthly payments so that you decrease them or increase them, but the main thing is if it's a general purpose loan, five years is the max. If it's a residential loan, it's 15 years is the max. There's a few loan rules. You can see the reference there if you want to look up those those rules. The thing about a loan is it's going to deplete your account balance for some amount by some period of time. So it's not in your account to grow and accrue earnings. So if the market is uh, averaging 8% annually per year uh, capital gains uh, and you're still paying it back at like 2.3% or something like that, there's going to be a difference between what you're putting into your account and what's actually um, what would have been there had you not taken out the loan. So I just did this uh, little chart here to show the difference in, over a 15-year period for a residential loan where they borrowed $50,000, paid it back in 15 years, and yet their account balance was still about $50,000 less than it would have been had they not taken out the loan. Of course, this is just one way of looking at it. It's just illustrating the trade-off. But of course, you know, if you buy a home, you got a place to live. That has value. And the home may even go up in value at the same time. So, so there's trade-offs. 
hardship withdrawals where you're taking a withdrawal and not paying it back for a financial emergency. The types of financial emergencies that you can experience are listed up there. You have to take at least $1,000 if you're going to do this. But it has some drawbacks. You know, permanently reduce your retirement savings. And you won't be able to make contributions for six months following a hardship withdrawal, which will mean that you won't get matching on contributions for six months. They're subject to spouse's rights, so your spouse would have to sign the, uh, the withdrawal form as well. Death benefits. The important thing with death benefits is that you check to make sure that uh, when you die, you got money in your account, it's paid to someone that you want it to go to. So there's two ways you can set this up. One is by default. The default is you don't do any paperwork, but you die, money's in your account, we pay it out according to statutory order. So if you're married, it's going to be your spouse. If you don't have a spouse, it'll be your children. If you don't have children, it'll be to your parents. If you don't have parents, it'll be to the executive of your estate. And if you don't have that, it'll be to the next of kin. If you want, you can do a designation of beneficiary form, which is this uh, form you see up on the right there, where you fill out specific individuals or a charity or even a trust. In a trust, you have a legal, uh, legal document drawn up to give instructions of how your TSP account will be paid out upon your death. So that's something you can designate as a beneficiary as well. What you uh, probably want to do is just double check to make sure that your account is set up properly. So you log into your account, go to the left-hand side on the menu, click on beneficiaries at the bottom. It's going to show you how your account will be paid out upon your death specifically. And if you want to make a change to that, you can submit a new TSP3 to cancel out the old one or a new TSP3 which will revert you back to a statute of order, or a new TSP3 with new beneficiary designations on it. So in the event of your death and uh, you're married, so your surviving spouse would be the person that uh, is the beneficiary, they can keep the money in the TSP under what's called a beneficiary participant account. So we automatically move the money into the life cycle fund that's associated with their age cohort, and they're going to be able to take withdrawals just like the original participant. Um, there are some various uh, things that change, such as uh, the RMDs, and uh, when they die, the money has to be paid out of the account. It can't pass to another beneficiary and stay in the TSP. And so when you get the slides, you're going to see there's a chart that gives you, uh, the, you know, the options you have. You can, they, they can move the money from their beneficiary participant account into their own TSP account or 401k or an IRA, and then there's some other things they're going to um, apply in those cases. If you die and your beneficiaries are non-spouses, they'll have a choice uh, to take the lump sum payment, which will be um, subject to federal income taxes. There's also the 20% mandatory federal income tax withholding on those payments uh, that we talked about earlier. And then the payments that, uh, that they decide that they don't want to receive is a lump sum payment they can transfer into an inherited IRA, which gives them the ability to stretch those payments out over time. They at least have to take the minimum amount, but they don't have that big tax hit all at once. So there are some ways that your account can be divided up because of uh, legal issues. Uh, one would be an IRS tax levy. You know, they'll ex IRS exhaust all their options to t get the money from the participant, and then the last resort will be taken from the TSP account. But it can also be divided up in a, in a divorce settlement, um, passed to alimony, passed to child support. Uh, the court can order the TSP account be garnished for those reasons, and also the victim's uh, Mandatory Victim Restitution Act. So our website, accessing our account, resources to contact the TSP with the Twitter, the Facebook, uh, the uh, YouTube videos, and uh, publications on the website you can download, which is kind of be kind of upper top portion of that screen where you see the uh, Facebook and Twitter symbols. Look to the left, and you see this is forms and publications, and that's where you find these publications. So we have a survey. If uh, you get the electronic version, you can just click on that link. And if you want to go to the survey and, and uh, answer some of the questions real short, we, we'd appreciate it. So that's all I have. I have right at noon. And uh, I'll turn it over to Phyllis. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, if you would fill out your surveys, and you can uh, lay them right here um, beside me. And appreciate you coming. Uh, the next. Uh, the afternoon session starts at 1 o'clock, and that is the pre-retirement withdrawal options. Yes. So the next session is at 1 o'clock. Thank you.